created Singularity University to look at these kind of exponentially growing technologies. And you, and you created eight fields of study where you thought there were potentially um, uh, explosive technologies that could really dramatically change the world. And I want you to go quickly, I want to go quickly through all eight of them and just get a, a, a quick sense of what you think the possibilities are, uh, starting with, with biotechnology. So biotechnology is the field I think uh, we're going to see the next $100 billion companies coming out of this decade. Uh, synthetic biology in particular, a lot of the work that folks like Craig Venter does. You know, at the point when you start to think of life as a programming language, um, that's what it is. We're starting to see high schoolers uh, in a number of competitions and areas starting to program uh, in ATCs right and GCs. Right now. You're not right talking now. about 10 years, 20 right, years right down now. the road. In, in high school and college. So literally the ability to synthesize DNA and sequence DNA and start to manipulate it, you know, all of a sudden I can start to have designer molecules for food, for fuels, for vaccines, and I start to look at life as a, uh, you know, a robotic function or a, a, a manufacturing facility function. Uh, Craig Venter, for example, just uh, published that he increased the efficiency of photosynthesis 300%. What's that going to do for food production? So you're going to start to have very disruptive uh, situations with biotech, every company will be affected in some way, shape, or form by biotech. Uh, computational systems. So, you know, one of the things that, uh, that computational systems gives us is the ability to model almost anything. And so what used to be the scarcest resource on the planet, if you needed 100 computers, you know, 30, 40 years ago, you'd have to have been the chairman of MIT, uh, or you'd have to be the, you know, the head of the Defense Department in the United States, now anywhere, anywhere on the planet can hire, you know, from cloud computing, 100, 1,000 computers for a minute, an hour, a day, and begin to model things. My friends at Autodesk, for example, are starting to model, you know, there'll be the interfaces where, as a designer, I can say, you know, I want the building to be energy neutral. I want it to be able to cost less than this. And the computer will start to take your words and whatever you want and shape, you know, everybody becomes an architect. I mean, these are futures that are really changing. Um, and again, you're not future. talking 10, 20 years down the road. You're, this is stuff coming online at Autodesk right now. <clears throat> networks and sensors. So, I mean, networks and sensors are really the question of changing the consumer packaged goods experience with their customers, being able to know what your customers need, where they are, what they're looking at, what they're buying. You know, people use the, the buzzword, the internet of everything. but these networks and sensors are going to give us huge amounts of data that we can begin to mine literally for anything we need, anything you want. It's a matter of what, it's asking the right question which is going to become more of the issue. Uh, so we're looking, for example, at launching something as audacious as a uh, earthquake prediction XPRIZE because I think there's enough data and enough sensors out there. It's just asking the right question of what the data and the networks are giving you. Artificial intelligence. So, I mean, AI has transformed almost every industry and will continue to do so, but where AI is going uh, that I think is very powerful is going to be to transform, imagine if you would, where an individual has a software shell around them. It's an AI that I have an intimate relationship with. And I'm going to give this AI permission to listen to every conversation I have, to read everything about me, to scan my genome, to, you know, literally know deep dive into everything I've ever produced, created, whatever, so that it knows me intimately. And it's going to start to literally finish my sentences for me. If I'm in a conversation with you and I'm looking at you, it's giving me data about you all the time. It's knowing where I have to go next. And by the way, you forgot this appointment and so forth. These AIs are going to, uh, you know, and this is a five-year horizon, are going to start to become uh, the most powerful assistants we have. They're going to become partners with us in our lives. Robotics? Robotics uh, are going to allow us, a, a friend of mine uh, is the uh, founder of uh, Willow Garage and Suitable Technology, Scott Hassan. He was an early Googler. He's committed hundreds of millions of dollars to robots, the PR2. He has one called Beam. So robots are going to be everywhere. You know, it's Google's autonomous car. Uh, it's obviously AI. It's, it's robotic it's Chris's drones. drones. Chris's drones, absolutely. <laughs> So the ability to extend your presence almost everywhere and anywhere, your ability to sort of beam into locations and conferences. So I think, you know, in five years we'll have conferences like this and people will be beaming in to participate if they can't physically be there. You'll have a few of these, these robots there. 
but think about the, the health care issues. So we're going to a world where people are getting older and older and older. We're going to have, you know, literally, if you, if you graph the, the number of uh, octogenarians uh, in our population, not even centenarians, octogenarians, it's beginning to spike. And the cost of a, uh, of a putting someone in an old age home, I think the average runs six to 80,000 a year. Imagine if you would, with a robot at much less than that rented, can leave, allow that person to stay at home. And so it's taking care of them, changing them, helping them go to the bathroom, whatever the case might be. So we have, you know, again, robots were, you know, people think about losing jobs from the US to China and India. Those jobs are going to go from China and India to robots, you know, when the cost of labor becomes the cost of electricity. So it's. And, and should people worry about that? I think, uh, I think we're going to end up in a scenario where uh, companies don't have any choice but to start, to start bringing robots online for their production or their workforce because they won't be able to compete. You, know, you might say, hey, I'm a humanitarian company. I only employ humans. That's great. It's until you're out of business. Um, uh, digital manufacturing. So 3D printing, digital manufacturing, again, uh, an amazing technology that is going to transform the global manufacturing base. Um, and anybody not looking at this, I was just talking to some folks uh, uh, in conversations with Lego, you know, Lego is not going to be in the plastic parts business. It's going to be in the, in the information business because you're going to have a Lego printer at home. I think about, uh, you know, the woman going to a gala that evening who goes online and sees a, uh, who sees a beautiful dress designed in Bangladesh that morning and prints it out on their VF Corporation printer in their closet at night. So the notion is being able to uh, print what you want, where you, you know, where you need it on demand. Um, I mean, that is where we're going. And com large companies are going to be concerned about, I have huge investments in plant that I no longer need. And again, how, far, how, how long are we talking about here? It's happening now. My friend who runs, uh, Avi, who runs 3D systems, we're beginning to be able to 3D print in plastic and glass and titanium and even in human cells. Um, I think we're going to see, you know, explosive change in that area. Uh, again, driven by consumer adoption, where the consumer wants this thing. I remember back when I was at MIT, you know, when the first Apple writers came out, I used to go pay a dollar a page, and I'd like, oh my God, there was a typo, and it's like, it's not too bad a typo. I think I'll keep that because it was a dollar for a page. <laughs> And now, you know, all of us sort of like have how many printers at home in your office. This is the next sort of generation, and, and the technology will move that way. Medicine. So medicine is becoming, has become an information technology. Um, we have at SU, we run programs. We have uh, executive programs. We run seven-day executive programs on all these fields, really what's in the lab today, what's coming to market in two, five, and ten years that will either decimate your company or like leapfrog the competition. Um, and we run a program specifically on medicine called FutureMed. And we bring about 80 hedge funds, VCs, a few physicians, a lot of healthcare uh, uh, CEOs and, and CIOs who come to this program. And it's really what is coming online in technology. So last year at CES, I was on stage with Paul Jacobs and we were announcing the Qualcomm Tricorder X Prize. So Qualcomm put up $20 million, 10 million for the prize, 10 million for the purse. And we launched a competition to build a handheld mobile device, it's the Star Trek tricorder. Basically, build me a device that any mom could use at 2 o'clock in the morning um, to diagnose themselves or their kid, no matter where they are on the planet. That's sort of the mindset we have. And it's a device that you'll speak to. It's got AI. It's got basically, you know, Watson on the cloud, if you would. Uh, it's got uh, lab-on-a-chip technology. I can cough on it. It can do an RNA or DNA analysis of the pathogens in my sputum. I can do a finger blood prick, we'll run a blood analysis, and, and basically allow us to, allow the person to self-diagnose, digitize their whole universe. Um, and we announced it, and a year later we have 265 teams in 33 countries around the world competing for this uh, globally. And we expect a winner in the next three years. So, I mean, there's a massive disruption, but you know, I know, for example, we're going to be short 91,000 doctors in the United States by 2020. We can't teach enough doctors. And that's great compared to the rest of the world, which is, you know, Africa is 25% of the disease burden and 1.3% of the healthcare workers. So this is the same way cell phones have exploded throughout the world. This will become your physician, ultimately. And number eight is nanotechnology. 
So nanotechnology, and we really look at nanomaterials versus nanotechnology, because nanotechnology is sort of so extreme in its uh, power that you, know, you might as well sort of give it all up. Um, but I mean, it's really about material sciences. So we're working on an X Prize, for example, of the future of mobility. So we're looking at uh, a battery X Prize for being able to increase uh, battery energy and power storage densities three to 500 percent. And imagine if you were the future materials, super high strength, lightweight materials, you know, with AI, with batteries, give us personal air transport. I mean, the convergence of these technologies are what are going to disrupt people in, in unusual ways.